Hello and welcome to Safe Havens Freedom Talk. My name is Rami Sam, and I've been invited to open this event. I do so because I'm an artist and activist in a global network defending artistic freedom. I'm so proud to be part of the Safe Havens community where we support each other's efforts and struggle for free speech and protections of artists at risk. Safe Havens meetings and Freedom Talks are some of the tools that we share for this cause. And today I'm very happy to introduce the brilliant Cathy Rowland, the co-founder of Arts Equator in Singapore, as well as art producer, writer, and editor with a very special interest in art censorship. Cathy today will lead the panel about the conditions of free speech and artistic freedom in Southeast Asia. Please don't hesitate to ask any questions to the panel through the Museum of Movement's Facebook account. And Cathy, I will leave it to you now to lead this fantastic panel and introduce this topic. Thank you, Rami. Hello and welcome to Arts and Culture in Southeast Asia, Proxy Wars, a collaboration between Safe Havens and Arts Equator. We come to you delighted from several cities in Southeast Asia this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Welcome everyone. Our panel of distinguished speakers will share about the way that power and the arts collide, confront and coexist in this regional um, space. They will discuss specific cases and share their insights into the underlying reasons and meanings of these incursions and outbreaks into artistic freedom. The first two presenters, T. Sassitaran from Singapore and Dr. Anne Lee from Malaysia, will speak for about 15 minutes each and we'll then take a couple of questions from the audience before we continue with Ari Sivaraza from Malaysia and Katrina Stewart-Santiago from the Philippines. Each will be sharing for 15 minutes each as well. Then I hope to have a cross-panel discussion and take some questions from the audiences as well. You can post your questions, as Rami has said, on the Facebook Live feed or wherever you're watching this from. So without wasting any time, let me introduce to you our first speaker, T. Sassi Taran. Sassi, as he's known, is co-founder and director of the Intercultural Theatre Institute. He writes and lectures on art, theatre training, performance, practice, and Singapore culture. And from 1995 to 2000, he was the artistic director of Substation, Singapore's only independent art space. Before that, he was the theatre and visual arts critic for the Straits Times newspaper, Singapore's main broadsheet. Sassi received the cultural medallion, the highest honour given to an arts practitioner in Singapore in 2012. Sassi, over to you. Thank you, Cathy, uh, and, and the good people at MOM. Uh, hello, everyone. It's night here, and um, I'm sure it, it might be light somewhere else. So I'm, I'm hoping that this talk will shed some light um, on the situation of censorship in Singapore. Uh, artists in Singapore have, have worked with the reality of censorship since Singapore became independent in 1965. Um, uh, this is a reality which I think we have come to imbibe and try to understand uh, in doing our work, in being able to find spaces within which we can be free. You could say that artists have a kind of a dance with the state and the censor. And I'd, I'd like to call this dance the Singapore three-step. It's basically one step forward and two steps backward. And every time you think we are making progress in, uh, in uh, freeing up art space, something will happen, a policy would be implemented, a law would be enacted, which would then drag us two steps backwards. And we've been performing this jig for as long as we can remember. And censorship in Singapore has evolved, it's, it's become more complex and complicated. In the, in the, in the 60s and the 70s, we had the, the, the old style red pencils, the black bolts, um, uh, scripts would be deleted, lines would be removed, images uh, would be taken out. And the only merit to that kind of censorship was that it was visible. 
it was clear that something was being removed. It was clear that a work of art was being defaced. And it was clear that we were experiencing and witnessing an exercise of power, usually an arbitrary exercise of power in order to curtail or silence information and speech. But over time, these regul these tactics that were used became invisible. They became part of a complex set of policies and laws which the state deployed as regulation. It deployed as administration. And most recently, with the efflorescence of art in Singapore, you, as you might know, Singapore uh, uh, fancies itself as a renaissance nation, as a nation which is a, a leader in, in artistic expression, uh, which is a, a global center that might attract culture and arts talent uh, from all over the world. And in this effort, there is a, a constant availability of money and funds. There's no doubt about that. But often, the money and the funds are used as seductive appeals, which would silence the artist. So there's been this shift from the crude, visible, brutal uh, acts of censorship, which we are all familiar with in, in most illiberal societies, to a much more finessed, uh, a much more sophisticated, and a much more invisible way of silencing. So what we are left with, what the audience is left with, is uh, a lack of visibility of how the silencing happens. And there is the illusion that there is no victim in the process of the state's control of the arts. Uh, why complain about the arts? Why, uh, why should people uh, uh, push or be act, 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 uh, conduct activism in order to, to reduce censorship when there was no visible victim. So there's been this evolution, which is part and parcel of Singapore's development as a city state. And the evolution of censorship, the landscape of censorship here is affected primarily by a series of censorship review committees. We have them once every 10 years or so, starting in, back in 1991. And every 10 years, the Minister of Culture or some other minister or Minister of Law, for instance, might convene a committee which consists, will consist of public uh, civil servants, politicians, uh, leaders in society, the great and the good, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who, run, who are running orchestras, people who are affiliated or associated with government cultural organizations, and they will basically decide on what the guidelines are of the restrictions are going to be. They will decide how and when dissemination and communication can be possible. And they have an immense impact on cultural production and on uh, the production of information uh, in society. And uh, over the years, the, the medium and the genres that if, effectively came under regulation has expanded. Uh, most recently, uh, it has included vlogs, blogs, uh, social media posts, uh, including, by the way, uh, media posts that are only, social media posts that are only for uh, friends only might be silenced or restricted, uh, you know, for its content. So the other aspect of, of censorship in Singapore, which has evolved with this process, is the censoring authority that the state has used in order to effect the silencing. This too, uh, one could say, has evolved. In the 60s and the 70s, there was the Public Entertainment Licensing Unit, the dreaded PELU, as we used to call it. Uh, the PELU was an arm of the Singapore police force. And it seemed appropriate that you know, the, the policing would be done by the police. You literally went up 
to the Pelu office, sat in front of a censor with your script and went line by line to see if something might be objectionable or something would have to be removed before a license for a performance would be granted to you. And often it might just be a word like nipple, for instance, would cause great consternation. Uh, and you'd be, asked to, uh, if, you'd be asked if the actor could not say the word nipple as if it would cause uh, some kind of revolution in society. Uh, and, and, and this is what we, we had to do. We would literally sit in front of the censor and negotiate what can be allowed and what can't be allowed. But slowly, this uh, uh, authority was shifted from the police, and now it rests with the Info Communications and Media Development Authority since 2003. So it kind of characterizes ostensibly an increasing sophistication in the mechanisms of control and the retreat of censorship from the realm of the overt and the visible to spaces of invisibility and recesses of policy and administration. Now, the regime of silencing and control has been so effective in Singapore and it's so subtle that the state has very much succeeded in implanting the fear of speaking in many people, in many citizens and people who happen to be in Singapore. So much so that the need for the censor, the very need for the censor has begun to disappear. It's been supplanted by the most effective mechanism of censorship that any authority could imagine. This is self-censorship. When the artist or the citizen or the speaker has been so pummeled into fearing what he can say and what he cannot say, or better still, if he doesn't know where the lines are, he prefers not to speak at all. Now, this, is, this has been, in my view, the evolution of censorship in Singapore. It's an evolution of increasing sophistication and effectiveness. I would like to point out a couple of cases now of censorship that's happened to give you an idea of the scope and the diversity by which control is employed by the state to silence the artists. My first example is a case, a notorious case called Joseph Ng, the Joseph Ng affair or the Brother Kane affair in 1994. There was an event at a shopping mall, a postmodern installation art, performance art event that included a number of genres that was run by an independent assembly of artists in a shopping center. It was a five hour e event that ran overnight. In that event, in that festival, there was a two minute performance of a performance art piece by Joseph Ng, which effectively was a protest at that time against the entrapment of homosexuals by the Singapore police force. Joseph Ng enacted certain actions and then stripped naked, turned away from the audience and snipped his pubic hair. This particular moment was captured by a journalist who was not supposed to be at the event because this was a private event and the press was not supposed to be there. Nevertheless, the next uh, afternoon, the tabloid, ran the picture uh, with the headline pubic art and that was it all hell broke loose and overnight funding for performance art was withdrawn by all the official bodies nobody could fund or present performance art in singapore overnight and what this this was uh, um, the means of control through money all funding was, was, was removed and any other foreign organizations which might have in, be interested in funding performance art was discouraged from doing so. So even you know, organizations like the Goethe Institute 
or, or, or the, um, you know, the Orléans Francais would think twice if they were going to, to fund or to present a performance art event in Singapore. Now, this caused immense hardship for many performance artists in Singapore who were forced to move out to other festivals overseas. Now, this, I, I cite this because I think this is unique in the history of art because the state, the Singapore state gained a singular distinction of a jurisdiction which not merely censored an artist or an artwork, but in one fell swoop, a whole genre of art and art making was censored. And it took 10 years before performance art could be rehabilitated and received funding again. The other uh, example I'd like to give you happened within the context of the Singapore Biennale. Now, this is a huge uh, festival that's, that's government funded and it's hosted by the museums. Uh, this happened in 2011 and it's, it was the closure of an exhibition by, by a foreign artist called Simon Fujiwara. The, the, the exhibition itself was called Welcome to the Hotel Munba. This was an installation art exhibition by the British artist Simon Fujiwara. And it was curated by the museum for the Biennale. Uh, the problem was that the installation included a number of what was deemed to be pornographic elements, uh, which were strewn on the bar and in the floor. What was interesting was that the museum allowed the installation to stand for the first week because the first week was open to trade, to arts professionals and to the international media. But at the end of the first week, these magazines were removed because they were deemed to be uh, improper and obscene for the lay public to see. Now, when the artist heard about it, of course, he requested for the exhibition to be closed. So again, we see uh, uh, the use of power by the state, a, a very uh, cynical and a very deliberate use where aspects of the exhibition were allowed to go on because for the benefit of the international media and for brand Singapore, but in effect, it was not allowed for Singaporeans to see. My third example is the banning of a film in 2014 by Tan Pin Pin. The film was To Singapore With Love. Uh, this was an internationally acclaimed film which essentially interviewed political exiles who were forced to live outside the country. Uh, because if they had come back because of their dissenting views, they would have been immediately imprisoned. Therefore, they had no choice but to leave the country. Tan Pin Pin, who was a, an internationally renowned filmmaker, traveled the world uh, and interviewed these people, essentially trying to understand what their connection to Singapore was. How do they see themselves still as Singaporean? And the film was banned, again, de facto banned, because by the time in 2014, the film rating system had already been in place. But the, the, the IMDA deemed that this particular film would not be allowed for all ratings, which in effect banned the film. But the ludicrousness of this act becomes clear only when you understand that the film was widely available over YouTube. And people would actually travel across the causeway to watch the film being screened in Johor Bahru. So it was not an effective censorship at all. Nevertheless, the state persisted because it wanted to draw a line in the sand, a symbolic line in the sand to say what was going to be allowed and what was not going to be allowed. And in effect, the film was banned, if you understand, 
because it began to question the founding mythology of Singapore. Because this is what these political exiles were questioning. They were questioning the right of the ruling government to form the historical na narrative which they claimed was the founding myth of Singapore's progress. And this would, would not be allowed. And there's another aspect to this which is very interesting because back in almost a decade ago, uh, a, f a play by the name, which was called The Lady of Soul and the Ultimate S Machine was allowed in Singapore after previously being banned. The play is by a political playwright by the name of Tan Tan Hao. It was an irreverent, satirical play, essentially criticizing the, the materialism and the economic imperatives that have guided Singapore's progress, namely, you know, the need for a soul. And it involved, you know, it criticized the civil service, it, it criticized the political elite. And the, the, the play was not allowed and or it was severely censored in 1992 and 1993. But overnight, in 1993, after the new uh, censorship uh, review committee had met, the play was passed without cuts. And it was staged by a, a leading company in Singapore, Theatre Works, and directed by Hong Kang Sen. Now, at that time, the government claimed that this was an example of how there will be no more censorship in Singapore. We will only have regulation and censorship would be used with a lighter touch. But within 10 years, we all saw Tan Pin Pin's film being banned, although ineffectively banned. So the government wanted to retain, even if it was symbolic, the power to draw the line as to what is going to be allowed and what is not going to be allowed. My fourth example is the NACs, the National Arts Council's withdrawal of funding in 2015 for Sunny Liu's The Art of Ch Charlie Chan Hock Chai. This again is another astounding, ludicrous move by the National Arts Council when it withdrew the funding of Singapore $8,000 for a graphic novel after its publication on the grounds that it is potentially undermines the authority of the government. Once again, if there is a work that even potentially questions or criticizes the legitimacy of the government, then no support can be extended to it. It will preferably be silenced, but if not, the agencies that champion the arts in Singapore will not be seen supporting it. As it turned out, it didn't matter that the NAC did not support this particular graphic novel. As it turned out, the art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai was a masterpiece in the realm of graphic noveling. It won three Eisner Awards, which is the equivalent of the Oscars for the artists. And it's globally recognized as one of the most brilliant graphic novels that we have ever seen. And what this demonstrates for me is the total ineptitude with which the National Arts Council looks at the merit or the demerits of a work which it is supposed to be supporting. It is simply exercising its agency as a government body to silence or to censor a work. My final and fifth example is happened in 2019. This is the cancellation of the Watain concert in Singapore. And it happened uncharacteristically within 24 hours, the cancellation happened 24 hours before the concert was supposed to go on, which meant that the organizers uh, and the sponsors uh, uh, incurred great losses 
business losses as a result of this. So the action by the government was quite a knee-jerk reaction, which is unusual for the Singapore government. The Watin concert was cancelled because the Christian community here objected to it on the grounds that the Swedish black metal band was anti-Christian and promoted Satanism. Now, despite this being a textbook case of manufactured offense or outrage, the minister of law nevertheless maintained in public that given that many Christians felt this was deeply offensive, denigrating, the ministry, uh, MHA, which is the Ministry of Home Affairs, advised IMDA to cancel. It was my decision that MHA should do so and advise IMDA. My officers and I took into account the rejection of the Christian, uh, the reaction of the Christian community and the broader security implications of that reaction, both in the medium and the longer term. This was a case not of the state exercising the right to censor, but of people. There was a frightening coalition of people who had come together and used democratic means to silence the expression of someone else in society. This, uh, this Christian community could have easily asked its followers not to go for the concert, not to, to buy tickets. It would have had no impact at all on the community's beliefs or the people who belong to the community would not be impacted in any way if they did not attend the concert. Despite this, they moved to have the event canceled. This to me was particularly frightening because finally it was not just the state census that we need to be worried about, but interest groups, religious interest groups or other political in interest groups with different agendas which could be motivated to silence and reduce the space available for uh, cultural production. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I hope I've given you some measure of the shift in the landscape that we've experienced as artists. You know, many people, particularly observers from abroad, are surprised to learn that freedom of speech and expression is actually enshrined in our constitution. It's understandable because Singapore's, uh, uh, Singapore's view, the view of Singapore amongst observers is that it is a highly illiberal society. These rights, the rights to free speech, have had the stuffing beaten out of them by serial legislation, by, enacted by successive parliaments, restricting, conditioning, and limiting them to the point of oblivion. So although the, the right is there in the constitution, its exercise has become almost impossible. Every Singaporean school child will tell you that these rights are not absolute, that the right to free speech is not absolute, and we must not expect that ever to be so. We have taught our children too well, I think, to forget that these rights actually do exist in our constitution. And that as citizens, we are entitled to these rights. If not absolutely, then at least fully and completely. It's only the contingency of politics that has continually silenced us and reduced the space for freedom of expression in Singapore. This has been done completely legally. There is a whole raft of laws which are in the books in Singapore, which enable the government to do the silencing, which enable the government to camouflage censorship as regulation, which enable the authorities to cancel or to remove uh, objects of art or other objects of cultural expression. Uh, I can go through these laws with you a bit later if that is necessary. What I'm trying to, to establish here is that all of this is legal in Singapore. 
censorship is legal in Singapore. And the fig leaf that is often used by the state is that there is a silent moral majority which essentially supports this censorship of art and of expression. This is something that artists have always questioned, this fictitious, moral, silent majority. We believe that this is just a figment of, an, of, the, polit, of the government's imagination in order to effect the censorship that it wants. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Sasi. Thank you very much for that. Um, I just was just, as you were speaking, I think just giving, taking us through the evolution and the increasing sophistication of the measures that are, and the tools that are used. A couple of things, you know, the, really struck me. The, the fact that the arts has the ability to challenge certain narratives that are created by the state is what makes it so powerful. And I think also this emergence of non-state actors as another force of censorship, which I hope we will We'll, be, we'll have a bit more time to discuss later in this, uh, in this evening. But right now, I want to just pick up on two things. Now, you've mentioned that there has been this emergence of, um, of a kind of policy framework versus, let's say, a more legislative legal framework, right? And just, just pulling that out, and, and we, as we understand, policies really are methods that governments use to reach certain desired outcomes. So it's, it's more of a carrot narrative than a stick narrative, whereas, you know, laws can be often, you know, have the force of, they have the force of being uh, enforced, they are often preventative. Um, how has this shift from using laws to one that is more policies, which is more bureaucratic, reframed censorship in the minds of the artists themselves in Singapore? Yeah, uh, as, I, as I try to say, uh try to mention in my speech, Kathy, the, the effect of these policies, the effect of these administrative uh, uh, strictures, as it were, is to make censorship uh, invisible. Now, I, I want to make something very clear. None of these policies are done without the, the power of the law behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. that there is legal sanction, which enables mm -hmm. government agencies and bodies to, to implement or to... to to conceive these policies in the first place. So there's no question about that. But mm -hmm. what happens is that, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. So if you, if you are a, a major government agency uh, that is producing art in Singapore, like the Esplanade, for instance, or if you are the Arts House, you are given a certain amount of leeway in order to decide what is possible for your programming. You're given a certain amount of scope. Now, Therefore, the act of censorship is devolved from the state to these institutions, which are actually presenting the work. The programmers, mm -hmm. the curators will be dealing with the artists directly. And this is where the negotiation can happen. So if there mm -hmm. is a depiction of a scene which might be deemed problematic or which mm -hmm. might be seen, uh, deemed offensive or, 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 or obscene, the... the the programmers can negotiate with the artist and the stick and the carrot becomes, well, if you want this work to be, uh, to be, to be mounted at all, if, if you want the work to be seen at all, then you'd have to take out that scene or you'd have to remove that line or, uh, you know, we will not uh, program this. Now, in the past, the artist would see this quite clearly. I mean, in my, people of my ilk and generation would have seen this as, pressure to censor. But there are many young people who believe that this is a legitimate process of negotiation and working with institutions. So right. because there is so much pressure to want to show your work, mm -hmm. understandably, artists are prepared to make sacrifices. And this is how I think the, 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 the state, in effect, inches into the process and you know, uses administration to, to silence uh, artists. It's, it's, it's self-censorship, but it is right. self-censorship through pressure from the state. Right. So kind of outsourcing of, uh, of yeah. the action. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I, because we, I'm just conscious of time, I, I want to thank you very much, Nasi, for, for the presentation and for just explaining a little bit more. Um, I'd like to actually move on to our second speaker and um, just a, a reminder to speakers, I, you might hear my voice saying time, 
if we are running out of time uh, in your presentation. Okay, um, so we'll move on to our second speaker, Dr. Ann Lee, who's a playwright, a researcher, and a researcher of political humor in theater, television, and social media, including contemporary indigenous satire. Anne has a PhD from Southeast Asia in, sorry, Anne has a PhD in Southeast Asian Studies from NUS and is a past fellow of the Asian Fellowship Program in Japan. She's currently researching freedom of expression in faith-based texts and working on an archive of art censorship in Malaysia. Her latest play is available in, in the publication Southeast Asian Plays, published by Aurora Metro in 2016. Anne? Great, thank you, Kathy, for that introduction. Um, thank you also to MOM for uh, the invitation to be here and everybody who's, who's here. Okay, now um, I'm gonna present a case study, uh, a work in progress that looks at censorship practice and satire or the satirical expression of dissent in a de democratic space. This space, Malaysia, has been variously called a hybrid democracy, a semi-democracy, and even a, a, a competitive authoritarianism, to use um, uh, Stephen Levitsky and Luke and Wei's phrase. The terms originally applied to Southeast Asian countries uh, uh, context, but, but have also been applied elsewhere. Uh, now, um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the next slide after that, thank you. Now, Judith Butler, uh, who, one of whose influential ideas is that gender is constructed, indeed performed, has also written that in a time of political science where agency and effects contend, and now of course there's also affect, um, terms like state, economy, have become less fixed, less stable, less stable. Now, I would like to suggest that, um, to, well, to extend the idea of less fixed and less stable to uh, censorship and satire. I will look at an example of satire or satirical expression of uh, dissent defined here as the mocking of authority by play. And in this case, the play involves a prime minister portrayed as a clown. Now, as a vehicle of satire, the clown is unreliable. Uh, the first reason is that satire is, is, is unreliable. Mocking authority means any authority along the political spectrum, uh, not just left, but also right. And these terms of reference themselves, left and right, may shift. The second reason satire is unreliable is that while the clown or fool uh, is in most, in most cultures a sort of, um, you know, a, a wise in disguise character, it is not always easy to tell why or how the, clowns, uh, the clown is playful because sometimes the clown may be sinister. We can also look at censorship as less fixed, less stable, less totalizing. We can agree that censorship has evolved, as uh, Sassi put it, uh, from red and black pen markers to spaces of invisibility, as he called it, in the recesses of policy and administration, and even you know, up until the point of self-censorship. But let me respond to a potential um, positivist thread in that argument. Uh, meaning, if there is a, a linear narrative of how censorship gets worse due to increasingly tighter laws, and so freedom of exp uh, speech, expression, and association becomes correspondingly prescribed, then we can also consider narratives or counter-narratives that show dynamics of, uh, of, of censorship uh, that are not as stable as fixed. Likewise, freedoms of speech speech acts and expression. My case study highlights a range of interesting contradictions that suggest a less fixed and less stable outcome of uh, censorship. And uh, this builds on the work by, by uh, Sumit K. Mandal, Susan, uh, Susan Phillip, and you know, a certain Kathy Rowland in this area. Uh, next slide, please. Now, Judith Butler's still valuable notion of the performative contradiction shows that certain speech acts. Um, can I have the next slide? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Judith Butler's still, still valuable notion of the performative uh, contradiction shows that certain speech acts can be said to undermine or contradict themselves. The performative contradiction is integral to any regulation or censorship law that states what it does not want stated. An apt example of this 
is Malaysia's Sedition Act 1948, passed during the British colonial administration, uh, interestingly just uh, 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 repealed in the UK in 2009, but still alive and well in Malaysia. Now, a broad definition of sedition or to show seditious tendency is to utter words that bring into hatred, contempt, or excite disaffection or ill will, membangkitkan perasaan, against a number of things, any ruler, any government, or to question any matter, right, status, position, privilege, and others in relation to the certain provisions in the federal constitution. The performative contradiction here is that when we talk about the Sedition Act, we also commit sedition. Next slide, please. This contradiction can be demonstrated by reference to a series of satirical expression of dissent by Fami Reza, what he calls visual disobedience, recalling civil disobedience. Now, um, in the Southeast Asian region, um, visual disobedience in the form of cartoons, comics, caricatures, and so forth, is, is, is the most researched area. Um, Zunar, I know uh, uh, the political uh, cartoonist, has also spoken at this panel. Um, but there are artists of various gender and sexuality, including Joy Ho, an illustrator and cartoonist. Her or their work can be found at uh, fever underscore dream. Shirin Rafi is a freelance uh, illustrator at wildd.sing. Both of them will be talking at a new narrative event, although its co-founder PJ Thumb is, is currently facing uh, increased persecution in Singapore. Click, thank you. Next one. Now, Fami Reza's work covers a broad number of years, but I focus on his portrayals of a former prime minister of Malaysia, Najib Tun Razak, who is now convicted of white collar crime concerning one, just one of many companies associated with a massive financial scandal uh, that he allegedly led uh, involving the theft of up to approximately 20 billion US dollars, I think that's about 17 billion euros, from a sovereign fund called um, the One Malaysia Development Berhad, or 1MDB, between the years 2015 and 2018. Next slide, please. Fami's depiction of the highest public officer in the land as a clown went on to become a face of a scandal that quite often because of its intricacy and complexity, bewildered many. Uh, now, kita semua penghasut means we are all seditious. The full line translates as if a country is full of corruption, well, if, when a country is full of corruption, we are all seditious. It points to the systemic and extensive reach of the alleged corruption. It also recalls the performative contradiction integral to any uh, regulation or censorship law that talking about sedition means we cannot escape sedition ourselves. Fami points out that in that year alone, 2015, 91 charges under the Sedition Act occurred, which as Amnesty International pointed out, was about five times as many uh, uh, in that one year than had been in the first 50 years of the act. Now this image uh, appeared on all his social media accounts, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Initially from 20,000 followers, but grew eventually to a domestic audience that can be calculated of around approximately 7 million. Stories about this particular clown, which I, I refer to as Fami Badut One, would also appear on the, uh, on the BBC, New York Times, CNN, Time, and elsewhere. These are only English language references, but reaching an estimated audience of 30 million. Next slide, please. But back then, uh, within an hour of posting the clown on Twitter, this rare and unusual notice appeared on his account, a warning from the Police Cyber Investigation Response Center. It had hardly made an appearance after this, but next slide, please. But by then, Fami had already posted the image on his main Facebook page. He would go on to repost the warning as well. It must be noted that an estimated 10.18 million Malaysians or over 40.5% of the population at the time were on Facebook in that year. Only 25,000 initially saw this on Facebook itself, but it was increasingly remediated elsewhere. Critically, the image also prompted a reaction from Graphic Rebel Untuk Protest and Activisme, or Grupa, the Malaysian Association for Rebellious Graphic Designers. Next slide, please. 
As Grupa states on its first Facebook page, we choose to remain anonymous at the public level, not because of fear, but because this project is not about us as individual designers, but about the causes that we are highlighting. At the time, new clown memes were posted in solidarity with Fami's initially every two hours, in turn remediated, some of which were more popular than others. Um, I've just selected a small selection here. Uh, um, on the bottom left, you can see a sort of Heath Ledger uh, 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 portrayal of the Joker. Um, in the middle above, there's a clown that has its right hand on a cat's neck. The text reads, he's choking us because we're all seditious. And on the, uh, on the immediate right there, um, the middle finger character is from an earlier coloring book um, by Fami, which lampoons an A to Z of politicians from all across the spectrum. And I highlight this because there's an interesting contradiction of Fami's own persona uh, in, in uh, that, that image. Um, he perpetually wears a blackberry, black shirt and black trousers. Um, and that is a, a lampooned here together with the sort of Ven uh, um, V for Vendetta kind of character. Um, and the bottom there, there's a, there's a, uh, we're all seditious in, in Jawi. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, Grupa would go on to produce over a hundred separate clown images. Next slide, please. Fami himself would produce over 80 clown images. In all, nearly 200 clown images were created during the first two months of 2016 and later re remediated. Fami was threatened with the Sedition Act once, but charged twice under the Communications and Multimedia Act 1998, section 2331A, which became the tool of choice. This is arguably ironic since an amendment to the Sedition Act was passed in 2015 after 11 hours of debate in Parliament to, among others, extend the reach of the Act on social media and increase the number of years in imprisonment if found guilty. Next slide. But what is also interesting is a jump from online to on ground that also happened. Evolutionary biologist uh, Richard Dawkins um, originally coined the word meme. He wrote that, you know, just as genes or, or DNA molecules propagate by leaping from body to body via sperm and eggs, so do memes go leaping from brain to brain. Now, he was also the first person to uh, apply the concept of a virus. And, uh, you know, today, of course, we, we call it um, going viral. But this online to on ground action here occurred in all 13 states of Malaysia based on printers who supplied stickers and t-shirts um, which were openly listed on, on FAMI's Facebook page. On the same page, people posted their on ground action of pasting stickers, uh, posters, redesigning uh, the, the, the clown for themselves and wearing uh, t-shirts that could also be bought from printers. In this way, the campaign took on life, took on a life of its own, as Fami states. Uh, now, proper documentation of this effect and affect of contagion is ongoing. Next slide, please. In real time, five months, five months after the first clown meme uh, appeared, this article appeared in Utusan Malaysia, the oldest national language, uh, national language Malay newspaper, which at the time had an estimated readership of just over uh, uh, half a million. Its headline is graphic, translates as graphic designer charged for posting fake image of the PM or prime minister. But it is the photo that demonstrates a prime example of the performative contradiction, namely the very same image that the verdict sought to uh, uh, censor by fine or imprisonment was held up for all to see by the artist himself. It would take another year for one of the charges Fami, uh, uh, was, was, uh, that occurred to Fami to be met with a verdict. Uh, in this, he was eventually found guilty of, uh, for using network services to transmit content that is obscene, indecent, false, menacing, or offensive in character with intent to annoy, abuse, threaten, or harass another person. He was fined 30,000 ringgit, uh, I think it's about 6,000 euros, but chose a crowdfunding site 
and managed to raise the full amount in cash from public donations within less than 24 hours, a clear demonstration of support for his work. In conclusion then, a number of contradictions presented themselves in this example of censorship and satirical expression of dissent in a so-called hybrid semi-demi democracy or um, competitive authoritarianism of a space. One, the performative contradiction that any regulation that states what it does not want stated can be found in the Sedition Act, whereby the Speech Act or talk about the Sedition Act is to be simultaneously committing sedition. Fami's clowning serves to highlight this contradiction not only as a some kind of small compensation, but a full-blown satirical expression of dissent uh, on both uh, online and off, uh, on ground uh, under the campaign theme of Kita Tsumua uh, Punghasut, that we are all seditious. The, the apparent impracticality of arresting everyone or the, uh, or the population on Facebook that may have observed one or more clown memes saw in effect one artist charged for two images instead of nearly 200 and none of the anonymous rebellious graphic designers. This was, so to say, censorship performed. Two, the practice of censorship is less fixed or stable than may be presumed by the existence of the law against it. The sudden rash of 91 charges under the Sedition Act that, that occurred in that year alone, the Sedition Act Amendment and the new tool of, of the choice being the Multimedia and Communications Act indicate outcomes of censorship are not necessarily guaranteed by the number of laws. Indeed, it may be said that the Sedition Act 1948 and its amendment in 2015 served to generate work by artists. Now, this, of course, draws on the argument of Michel Foucault, by, some, uh, by whom you know, some of uh, Judith Butler's arguments uh, are also influenced, but that there are no relations, about, uh, no relations of power without resistance. The resistance is formed where power is exercised. In other words, uh, famously, power by the state is productive, not simply repressive. A final contradiction is that uh, not all state bodies, such as the government-owned media, will produce a consistent line. Utusan Malaysia added uh, a half a million viewers to see the clowning image. The point being that vulnerability and precarity exist in explicit acts of prohibition and censorship, because instead of shutting down public debate, they can lead to proliferation of it instead. Okay, thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks, Anne. It was fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I was thinking that, you know, your presentation really highlights some of these, as you said, the contradictions and also this, these instabilities, right, inherent in the way the state tries to control artistic production, that in, in trying to silence it, it actually creates more noise. And in trying to contain it, it attracts more attention to the works that it's, it's trying to suppress. Um, and it almost seems from your presentation that artists have some kind of advantage and upper hand in some cases, but perhaps lack the tools to take advantage of these contradictions. From your case study that you've been studying, I know in, in Indonesia as well as in Malaysia, but perhaps just to, looking at Fami's case, what lessons do you think we can draw as artists, as art workers from the way that his case unfolded? I, I'm struck by if we would, if what Sassi was talking about seemed like an outsourcing of, of control, this almost feels like a crowdsourcing of resistance, right? Because of the hive and the way that um, uh, there was this replication of his work. Can you maybe share? Yeah. Yes, I, I, well, I think um, um, what is interesting here is, is that Fami was able to get support from other artists, specifically mm -hmm. in that genre. Um, but that kind of gave, gave it much more, you know, gave it much more legs. It, it continued for a much longer period. And I think that artists can work together uh, when, when something happens in a way that typically artists may not because either for genre differences or because of, you know, some kind of, you know, habitual distancing and, and so forth. Um, but I think uh, also he had huge, you know, his, well, 
significant public support. You know, he has, although it's urban based, it's quite a range in terms of uh, class and, and age uh, uh, background. I think that the, you know, the, the way it could jump from online to offline, um, mm -hmm. I think was, was very much a part of that. Uh, now, I don't think it extended because, you know, I think it's, it's been quite well covered that, you know, even from sort of the so-called Arab Spring that, you know, you can't have a revolution by online, you know, Twitter, you know, it really does depend on how strong the on-ground infrastructure mm -hmm. is um, in order to be able to then carry through uh, some of the change. But I think that uh, it's it sort of um, that idea of artists being able to work together in order to extend uh, uh, um, um, a kind of resistance and uh, being able to persuade a, a range of of, uh, of of public following w would be something that you know could be tried again, uh, perhaps. Uh, uh, but this was something which you know it, it had its perhaps you know the idea, the sheer scale of the one MDB uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, scandal was just uh, uh, could could take up that much population involvement. Thank you. Sasi, could I ask you just, um, because there are so many differences and similarities between Singapore and Malaysia. I mean, there's a shared history, but then there's also just really deep, deep gulfs of differences between them. And, and you've mentioned uh, the Renaissance City Plan, which in 2000, uh, the Singapore government launched a massive um, and very detailed roadmap into turning Singapore into a Renaissance City of the Arts and invested a lot of money in infrastructure and human resources to make that a reality, right? Um, in Malaysia, on the other hand, Arts and culture has received very little state investment. We've had progressive governments that have promised to do this, but generally the Ministry of Culture, uh, Arts and, and Tourism, or whichever iteration it is at the moment, because it changes, um, you know, has, has not really had the political will behind it to really kind of develop the arts infrastructure. So I want to ask, right, do these differences translate into, you know, more growth, but less freedom in Singapore versus less growth, but more freedom of the arts in Malaysia. I mean, how simplistic or accurate is a view like this? Both, it's a question to both Sasi and to Anne. Uh, it's, I, I don't think uh, it's possible to, um, to, to, to think about the, the, the possibility of freedom uh, just in terms of uh, the uh, the funding levels, the infrastructure support, the government, uh, you know, uh, involvement in the arts. I, I don't think it's, it's, it's about just about the money and the, the level of development. I think really what's behind the, the money and the infrastructure is centralization of authority. Uh, I think that, that, is, that becomes the, the critical thing the structures of work the structures of production the means by which a, a, an artist can create work becomes more and more uh, an aspect of government control uh, and because in singapore because singapore is so small and because of, of the tremendous efficiency uh, with which the, the systems are managed in Singapore, uh, it's not just about the fact that there's been a lot of uh, money and development, but there has been a corralling of centers of power. I mean, from, from simple things like spaces for performance, uh, uh, the walls for exhibitions, uh, uh, control of publication, uh, control of the internet. Uh, and again, this again uh, reflects not just uh, uh, economic power, but the power of parliament and legislation to control uh, the way in which artists can work. So essentially, the state has uh, taken over the means of production mm -hmm. that were available to, it, to, to the artist. Now, I suppose in a, in a larger country, which, is, uh, which has less uh, regular uh, development, uh, there will be aspects of work which the state or an authority may not be able to control. And there, I think, is where there is the possibility of, uh, you know, freedom and originality.
to blossom. So I don't think it's a direct relationship, but I think it works through uh, uh, control of systems and control of, uh, of power. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Thank you. Unfortunately, I think we I just got a time reminder. So we have half an hour more. So I'm, I'm going to actually just move on and we'll, we'll save your answer and your response to that for, for um, when we move on. And I think I'll quickly just introduce the next speaker. Um, and just a reminder to those of you who are listening in, you can actually post your comments on the Facebook Live pages or on Vimeo, wherever you're watching this, and the questions and comments will be fed back to us. Um, Siva, I'll introduce you right now. Um, our Siva Rasa read law at St. Anne's College, Oxford, as a Rhodes Scholar. With other activists, he founded Malaysia's leading human rights advocacy organization in 1989 to campaign for the repeal of the infamous Internal Security Act. In 1998, after the reformacy or reform movement ignited in Malaysia, he entered the political arena and is now a third term member of parliament. He is married to Anne James, a prominent actress in the Malaysian theater scene. Siva, over to you. Uh, thank you, Kathy, uh, for that quick introduction. And can I start by thanking uh, MOM for this opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, and uh, I'm going to try in the, in the next 15 minutes to give a quick, like a bird's eye view of um, artistic, cultural, and also political, or, or rather the limits on, on artistic, cultural, and political freedom of expression in Malaysia. And it was great listening to Sasi and Anne earlier, you know, speaking from the Malaysian and Singaporean perspectives. And um, again, I think it's a good reminder to see how much of a common journey actually these two countries have traveled together uh, in our histories. Although, of course, as Cathy, you pointed out, there are also, of course, differences, clear differences between the two. Now, um, Malaysia, like Singapore, has a whole armory of laws uh, basically intended to control expression. And uh, I think in both countries, you will find uh, the roots of that, that uh, the system, the systemic control through those laws start in colonial times. Uh, Anne Lee just mentioned the Sedition Act, uh, and that's, a, that's which was in uh, Malaysia, we had it in 1948. The British introduced it as a form of political control and of course instituted uh, mechanisms basically to control um, creative forms of expression as well because uh, the, you know, the British, the, during the British colonialism which was with us until 57, uh, there were movements for independence and the British were very, British rulers were very concerned about uh, emerge, uh, we call it independence movements using uh, culture and art to promote the ideas, the subversive, what they consider the subversive ideas of independence and so on. And at that time, as we know, both in Malaysia and Singapore, left-wing movements, including uh, the, what is then known as the Communist, Malayan Communist Party, also got involved. And so you had this paranoia, in a sense, you know, developing vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, 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 the left-wing movements of, of this part of the world. And that is really the legacy from which much of the repressive legislation comes from. So if I could start with the first slide, what I've done and, um, is just to, to list out so that you get a sense of the, what I call the armory of laws uh, that, that are used regularly from time to time in Malaysia uh, to basically control actually freedom of expression and uh, uh, Kathy, you, you, I think you also documented uh, in a website the, all the instances really of use of such laws. And if I'm not mistaken, in perhaps in the last 30 to 40 years, you've documented at least 50 over cases of such use of such laws to control all forms of uh, artistic expression from film, uh, books, uh, performance art, and so on. So I'm not going to go into it in too much detail because I think uh, but just to, say, to mention these key ones, um, the full censorship board act of 2002, uh, ostensibly to control obscene or lewd films, but basically uh, says that every film that is shown in public in this country must be approved. If it's not approved, 
and you do it, that's a criminal offense, you can go to jail up to five years. And these laws are not often actually, I mean, in a sense that not many people actually get prosecuted, but from time to time, you'll get a, uh, you'll get a prosecution to, to make this send a message to people. So the recent case I've highlighted here is the charging of uh, activist uh, Lena Henry, who works with uh, uh, an NGO called Comas. Comas, uh, Comas is, pro is in the business of promoting uh, alternative filmmaking and so on. And uh, she was charged in court for screening uh, a well-known uh, movie called No Fire Zone about the massacres, the massacre in 2009 in Sri Lanka by the Sri Lankan army of almost about 100,000 Tamils, mostly civilians. And um, we had, it was interesting that that screening, uh, that screening also took place in Singapore. It took place in the Malaysian parliament. I was part of that with no consequences. But when she showed it in public, uh, she was arrested, charged, uh, convicted, and finally fined 10,000 ringgit as a reminder to all of the consequences of breaking the Film Censorship Board Act. Now, if I can quickly touch on the next uh, laws, the next screen, please. The next slide. Uh, oh, hang on, maybe it's got a bit mixed up. Um, the next one, please. Uh, the Finas Act, that's right. Finas Act is, is what, what would be called the National Film Development Corporation Act. Again, this is to regulate production, distribution, and exhibition of films without licenses. To produce a film, you need a license. To distribute it, you need a license. To exhibit it, you need a license. If you don't, it's a criminal offense. A jailer up to three years. And the examples of the kind of draconian powers eh, that are given to the state through such laws. If I could go one slide back, please. Uh, one slide back. Um, yeah, I mentioned this one. This is not so much legal. How stage performances, theater performances, uh, well, legal in the sense that they control through local authority regulations, again, through issues of, through issuance of licenses. As Sasi had mentioned, uh, S Singapore went through that period. We also went through that period. Scripts had to be sent in. There was a detailed negotiation on, on what could be put in, what could be, what had to be taken out in order for that play or stage performance to take place. Now it seems more relaxed where we say we just send in synopsis, but still the process of control is still pretty much there. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a regular reminder to artists that this is the, these are the conditions eh, under which you work. And um, I mean, again, it's too short a time to, dis to discuss actual instances. But I think Cathy's documenting of, uh, of uh, there are enough instances of interference uh, in stage performances, in scripts, uh, of censorship, of warnings, stopping performances after a few days, uh, sometimes even stopping them before they start, and so on. Next slide, please. If I could go past the next one, I've touched on this. Uh, yeah, this is a recent um, development of the Finas Act, just happened in July this year, where the current government, yeah, um, the, minister, the Minister for Communications and Multimedia in the current government, uh, suddenly announced in parliament, causing a big uproar, that the license requirement of Finas would also be extended to all films made uh, and shared on social media. Now, so this caused a huge uproar and uh, he, he, was, he was made to withdraw his statement. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it, it, is, it is obviously an impossible requirement to expect people, I mean, to, given the amount of stuff that is shared on social media today, especially first video documentaries and so on. I mean, obviously it is a very silly remark to make. It was, a little, a literal, lit, it was basically a literal interpretation of the, of the words in the act. But the bigger point that was missed in that, in that uproar, in the conversation that took place, was that the Finance Act really has no place whatsoever in any democratic society. That you would control, uh, you know, the making of films to that degree uh, of control, possessing, uh, distributing, uh, you know, uh, films and all that would be subject to licenses in that manner. That point was sort of kind of overlooked, but I mean, I think for Democrat, activists for democracy, this act would be one of the acts that we have to remove uh, in order that one day Malaysia will practice a true democracy and not the sort of authoritarian version that we have now. 
Next slide, please. Uh, this is another example of printing presses and published years. In fact, this is, you can't run a printing press in Malaysia without a license. Likewise, you can't publish a newspaper without an annual renewable license. And there's a general clause in this law to basically ban any undesirable publication. So, for example, it is used for books, to ban books, to ban multimedia productions, films. And uh, to give you two quick examples, Amir Mohammed, a well-known author, wrote a book on exiled uh, Malaysian uh, communists living in South Thailand. And again, you know, the, the sensitivity to alternative histories, uh, like Sasi mentioned, the histories or perspectives of exiled Singaporeans uh, was something unacceptable to the Singapore state. And in the same way, the narrative of the, uh, the war, the internal war we had uh, with, with the Malayan Communist Party prior to independence, post-independence, again, for the Malaysian state is another unacceptable discussion. It's, it can't be allowed to happen. And Amir Muhammad's book was banned as a result. You know, on a different theme, Sisters in Islam, a well-known NGO in Malaysia, uh, advocating for a pluralistic, uh, inclusive Islam, a progressive Islam, had a book on women in Islam. And again, uh, that book was promptly banned. But here, Sisters in Islam took, uh, took the issue to court and produced a happy ending in this one. Uh, they won their case at all levels, High Court, Court of Appeal. And it was, it was a good decision on the part of the federal court uh, to reverse the ban. And the book is available for everybody uh, to read. So different activists have responded differently. Fami Reza, in the example, um, and Lee just gave, took, took the opportunity to, to run a social campaign and very well as well. Uh, sisters took a, a legal challenge other, other artists have sometimes just accepted the outcomes and, and gone on to do, well, to live with the laws or to, to modify their, their creative activities, you know, adjusting with the laws and so on. Next, please. This is the Sedition Act, and Lee has mentioned it. Uh, old colonial law, broadly worded offenses covering criticism of the state, judiciary, monarchy, inciting ill will between races and so on covers literally all forms of publication, punishable by jail. Coincidentally, I've been charged under this act for making statements uh, criticizing UMNO, the dominant party in the previous government, uh, manipulating the judiciary in the case of Anwar Ibrahim, and got charged. And uh, likewise, well, luckily, we managed to change the government in 2018 May. And uh, as a result, the, the charges were withdrawn under the new, more, of course, liberal Pakatan Harapan government. Um, but this Sedition Act, as been mentioned earlier, is really broadly used. I mean, a large numbers of people, activists, creative people, political activists, uh, have been arrested and charged under this, this act. And uh, it's again, it's one of the black marks on on the on the democracy we claim to practice in Malaya. Government should have amend, uh, repealed it. We didn't get down to it, and. Um, uh, this country will continue to pay the price for, uh, you know, for not repealing this act earlier. Next, please. Uh, after the Sedition Act, I just want to quickly touch on, uh, this is a touch on this, next one. This is control of stage performances. Uh, visual arts, yeah. Visual arts, again, you know, uh, control through laws as well, some of them I've mentioned. Otherwise, through basically through administrative action, local authority regulations, Overzealous bureaucrats, uh, bureaucrats sort of uh, trying to uh, double guess what the, the state wants, you know, in terms of what is permitted in the public space and so on. Also control to control of uh, exhibition spaces. And um, again, in uh, Cathy's documentation of uh, the examples of the past, there are any number of, uh, there are many examples of uh, visual arts, uh, what do you call it, free, uh, creative experience. Uh, uh, events being interfered with or being made to, you know, the, the, the artwork being removed uh, and so on. Next, please. So, in short, um, the, the armory of laws is clear and I think Singapore has gone through the same uh, process. It's probably that the laws have become more sophisticated in, in, in Singapore. We tend to be still in the uh, more crude phase, uh, you know, directly using some of these laws in a very uh, openly 
uh, oppressive and, and draconian manner. Uh, can I go on to my next uh, slide? Uh, Siva, I, I just uh, want to point out. Just one minute, yeah. Oh, Thanks. Would like, you like to finish your point and then is that, oh, you I, I just finished, right? yeah. So basically, just to quickly make a point about where the controversial areas are, um, we have the, 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 the legacy of the battle against communism keeps, you know, rearing its head. And um, uh, artistic forms that tend to provide alternative conversations, usually themselves are the wrong end of the stick. Likewise, is the development of Islamic conservatism. So in other words, uh, conversations, artistic conversations around progressive Islam tend to get uh, censored or criticized and controlled. Likewise, because of a deeply conservative uh, uh, more mores in Malaysia right now, uh, in stage performances, nudity, uh, sexual scenes, uh, LGBT issues, all these have become problematic and they invite reactions and, and, and control. So this is the current context uh, where we are in Malaysia, um, uh, kind of uh, legacy issues of, of our of our battle with uh, you know left wing movements, uh, deep a uh, deep uh, conservative Islamic awareness in you know in many sectors of the people, and um, this is what I think uh, remain big challenges for the artistic community in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siva. And our final speaker today is Katrina Stewart Santiago, who is an independent cultural critic and opinion writer from Manila and a contributing um, writer for CNN Philippines. She's also a published writer. Her essays have been published by Anatoa uh, University Press. Her role as a critic has fueled her activism, which cuts across issues of cultural labor, systemic dysfunctions, and institutional crises. She is a founder. She is a co she is, sorry, she is the founder of Pagasa. People for Accountable Governance and Sustainable Action, which seeks to build a new civil society for the urgencies of the present. Katrina will be sharing her, her presentation in a pre-recorded uh, recording, and then she, although she's here in li life and in, in the flesh. Um, and once we finish with her presentation, I'll ask all of the panelists to switch on your cameras, and then we can have our discussion. Thank you. Hi, I'm. Uh, I actually pre-recorded my presentation, um, but I'm doing a very short introduction just to say that I think the experience of the Philippines might be very different from um, Singapore and Malaysia. Um, also because we live on the premise of a democracy, of living under a democracy. And so this presentation is really a work in progress and it's something that I've fleshed out with Kathy and, um, and, and, and Anne, I think, for a previous panel. And it tries to flesh out exactly what it is that's going on in the Philippines at this point in time where we like to pretend that we are in a democracy and that our freedoms are intact when in fact it isn't not anymore and so I'd like for you guys to check out the presentation and we'll get your questions later. Can you please play it? Pointing to the contrary, a militarized government when we talk about censorship in the Philippines, the narrative necessarily falls back on the Marcos years. From 1972 until 1986, during the 14 years of martial law, media was shut down and cultural work was regulated. In the four and a half years of the Duterte government, the threat of a martial law declaration has become not much more than a soundbite that comes from Duterte himself. This allows the Duterte to pretend that we are not under any kind of dictatorship and that we aren't living under a version of martial rule. This, despite all indications pointing to the contrary, a militarized government and corruption, violence against the people, and thousands dead. It doubles as a threat, adds on to the climate of fear that this government has nurtured even as it sells the idea that democracy is still intact, our freedom still ours. Critics can say what they want, media continues to exist, and there is no censorship as it is so defined. But if there's anything we know now, censorship need not be imposed for it to be in effect. To some extent, much of what has happened in arts, culture, and media during this pandemic has revealed how well-planned and well-played government strategy has been. 
It ensured that at some point like the present, there wouldn't even be any need for a declaration of martial law at all. The people will be scared enough and exhausted enough to just fall silent. As far as the arts and cultural sectors are concerned, this strategy started in 2016. Soon after Duterte won the presidency, he started putting allies in key cultural positions. While these appointments are a matter of presidential prerogative, these are still usually done with due respect to the credentials required for the position and the credibility the appointees have with the sector. For Duterte's brand of devil may care, these didn't matter. A part of a small-time political dynasty, local government employees from Duterte's Davao, his ex-teacher, those who campaigned for him in 2016. These are the profiles of the people who were appointed by Duterte into key cultural agencies such as the Cultural Center of the Philippines and the Film Development Council of the Philippines. One of the key points to be made about these appointments is how there was very little pushback against it from the cultural sector itself. Few of these appointments even made the news. But this one did. Duterte appointed a non-librarian as director of the National Library of the Philippines. This was not only highly irregular, it was also against the law. The Philippine Librarians Association actually dared question this particular Duterte appointment and one of their members actually filed a case with the ombudsman. Expectedly, Duterte ignored the pushback from the sector, which just emboldened his appointee to be just as dismissive and even to lie about the law. Other than the National Library, the appointments to cultural institutions have been rarely criticized. Appointees such as the head of the Film Development Council of the Philippines courted the industry she was to represent doing dinners, claiming to do consultations, and gathering a collective around herself that echoed the notions of unity and nationalism as Duterte himself was wont to repeat. Travel assistance, film fests, awards, parties, these were used to build upon this superficial notion of unity. As the cultural institutions were slowly being taken over by Duterte's people, the state propaganda machinery gained a foothold over social media discourse. Disinformation was the name of the game, and massive resources were being put into not just spreading falsity, but also attacking those who were critical of government. The massive disinformation campaign and the contingent hate and vitriol that it comes with is critical to the state of arts and culture the past four years under Duterte, because the climate of fear is about as real as one's own personal decision to disengage, whether for one's own sanity or because of one's fear of being attacked on social media. When the pandemic hit and the nation was put on lockdown in March and April of this year, this was our status quo. As the majority of workers in the arts and culture sectors were hardest hit, cultural institutions filled with Duterte appointees had no choice but to rise to the occasion. They provided as little assistance as they could while gaining favor from the members of the sector who felt lucky to get any assistance at all. This is consistent with the strategy of throwing parties and holding dinners to gain the support of the sector, except that this time you are using the pandemic and the task of providing relief and assistance to gain the same amount of control. Here, gratefulness is a way towards possible self-censorship, where one is made to believe that whatever it is we get from government is a privilege instead of it being our right to public funds. The debt of gratitude runs deep in this country and government knows this well. To some extent, this set the stage for the Duterte government to sail through some of the most critical policies and decisions it has made in relation to arts, culture, and media during this pandemic. Early in July, Duterte's men in Congress and the Senate approved the anti-terror bill, the possible long-term effects of which is self-censorship out of fear. After all, it penalizes just the intent to incite others through speeches, writings, proclamations, emblems, banners, and other representations tending to the same end. Our intentions and what these mean will be judged by people appointed by Duterte into key positions, mostly military men. There is every reason to fear this terror law when no less than the Justice Secretary has said that we could be considered as terrorists for the ideology that we believe in. Soon after the passage of the anti-terror law, Duterte's men in Congress were able to shut down the largest multimedia institution in the country. They were merely acting on the threat Duterte had made countless times against ABS-CBN. The ABS-CBN shutdown is the biggest proof that censorship exists in the country.
During the 12 days of hearings in Congress, a chunk of the time was spent nitpicking about the network's content, not just in terms of the news that it carries, but even in terms of the portrayal of politicians in its soap operas and the sensitive romantic scenes in its other TV shows. Done in the midst of hunger and need, exhaustion and fear, this is the most violent act of censorship thus far under Duterte, rendering as it does 11,000 workers jobless in the midst of a pandemic. At the forefront of this battle for our cultural workers and against censorship should have been our cultural institutions. But this is where the status quo comes in and where the moves of Duterte and his appointees in the cultural agencies since 2016 bear fruit. Our cultural agencies have no choice but to stand with Duterte. At the very least, they cannot take a stand against these acts of censorship. That this happened at all during this crisis should have been enough reason for a citizenry to collectively make itself heard out on the streets in the loudest voices possible. But given a militarized response to the pandemic, the status quo of silencing, and the new law that penalizes our intent, plus a monolith like ABS-CBN being shut down, the climate of fear is solidified. This is not to say that there hasn't been pushback against this government's moves to muzzle the press, to censor works, to threaten critics, and to regulate culture. It's to say that the ways we push back and the lack of a larger collective pushing back on the same thing has allowed government to dismiss us as nothing more than a noisy minority. These ways of silencing, deliberate and otherwise, are insidious and so far effective. There is no censorship, but we are afraid. There is no censorship, but we can be harassed and threatened by the president himself on live television. There is no censorship, but we can be jailed or killed. We realize now that censorship comes in many forms, and in the hands of Duterte, given a divided populace now exhausted and at the mercy of a well-funded propaganda machinery, it doesn't take much to see that through well-calculated coercion and insidious silencing, self-censorship has become second nature. So how do we move forward? Here's a starting point. Realize that Duterte is just as afraid of us as we might be of him. After all, the push to regulate and control culture continues, proof that they are as afraid of the possibility that we might gather one massive collective that can tip the balance and shift the power to our side. History, of course, teaches us to keep going, as many others do, no matter how small the acts of resistance. I end with a very short clip that I think captures the state of affairs in the Philippines when it comes to the kind of authoritarian rule we live under and the strategies of containment and ways of silencing that we've lived with the past four years. As acts of resistance go, this is mine. Authoritarian regimes are always, you know, mm -hmm. because you need to symbolize. The Why need. is this an authoritarian well, regime? Is that what you're saying? Oh no, uh, <laughs> it's in character, in in uh, in consequence, yes, but not in character. <laughs> Katulad namin mga congressman. So you can. Boto lang namin ng boto kay pangulo dahil sa takot namin. Uh, no, but wait, you. Ang ABS, no, expire ang contract ninyo. Mag-renew kayo, ayawan ko lang kung ang mamayari sa inyo. Ako pa sa iyo, pagbili na ninyo yan. Ayan, nationwide man yan. Ikaw, ABS, ABN, you're a mouthpiece of me. Ang inyong franchise mag-end next year. If you are expecting na ma-renew yan, I'm sorry. You're out. I will see to it that you're out. Thank you very much, Katrina, uh, for your presentation and that act of final resistance at the end. I think it's a reminder that, um, you know, we, we, we are part of an active field of practice, right? It's not something abstract or academic. And I want to also thank Sivarasa just now for his very masterful kind of taking us through the legal landscape, but also for adding that very personal note that he himself has been, uh, you know, the subject of the Sedition Act and you know, that has had to pay some uh, big personal prices for his choices as well. 
Um, so thank you very much all to all of our panelists. We've got, we're just going to, we've got a little bit more time. We're going to slightly extend the time. We're supposed to end now, but really I feel that um, maybe we can take another 15 minutes to have a quick discussion and take some questions. I want to also just once again say to anyone who is watching this live, there are some problems with the Vimeo, but you can catch this. Uh, I'm assuming that you're catching this on Facebook, either on MOM or on Articulator or on HowlRound. Please do post your questions or comments if you would like to address them to members of the panel. So um, very quickly, right? So whatever it is, no matter, you know, by any measure, arts and culture in, in the countries that we are all talking about today, um, they are relatively kind of niche practices. They are small. They are not really a huge part of the wider public sphere. And that's because of, you know, education, income inequality, access, and, you know, a lack of access to the arts and, and so on. But yet when points of deep, deep conflict and controversies happen, often they are around cultural works. They are about paintings, they are about films, they are about books, they are about a play, they are about a dance that maybe, you know, in reality, 300 people would have seen. But then they become sites of really um, very acrimonious battles, right? by stakeholders and players who would not normally enter the cultural sphere. And I mean by this, both uh, state actors, but also non-state actors. Why? Why do you think, I mean, what do these stakeholders gain from these incursions into arts and culture? Katrina, do you want to? <laughs> what do they gain? Well, they have access to public funds. Um, I think uh, as far as at least this government is concerned, it's become pretty clear that it's the it's having access to public funds, being able to use it for government propaganda, unlike never before, at least unlike, um, at least not since the Marcoses. So I think there's a very clear sense of how cultural, of how the cultural sector can function and how if they put the right people there early enough, then they can actually use it to their advantage, especially now that we're moving towards the next elections. So with the concentration of funds, just going around a very small group of people that are all very uncritical of the government, then mm -hmm. they really have so much to gain by also being able to silence the cultural sector in the process. What happens when, when so I, and what happens, or what are the reasons, for example, Sassi, if I can address this question to you, for example, we, we take the case of um, When Tango Makes Tree, the book that was uh, in the National Library, a children's book that depicted a same sex penguin couple, family. Uh, and um, there was a whole kerfuffle over that. The library, you know, removed the book, and then there was backlash. And so, what you know, and that was something that was enacted by a non-state actor, as far as we know, right? It was basically a member of the public that wrote a letter and had the power from that one letter to actually get a whole institution to act upon this little children's book. Um, I guess my, my, my question is really, why do these public battles gain so much attention? Uh, what kind of proxy are they for, right? What are they really about? Is it really about a children's book? Yeah, uh, no, clearly, Cathy, it's, a, it's, as you say, it's a proxy. And I think one of the, the great uh, fissures, you know, one of the great fault lines in society today, at least in Singapore, as I see it, is, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the issue of sexual orientation, the issue of uh, what constitutes a family, what, what you know, what, what does it mean to be families uh, and uh, obviously at the background is our uh, issues of religiosity uh, and religious beliefs so um, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, you're right I mean the arts in effect reach a very small minority of people and they they hardly have any real political clout but the symbolic power of a book of a play of, of a visual image, you know, as, as Anne has so clearly shown, you know, in the, in the work of Fami. I mean, the symbolic power of these, of these artifacts, I think, are amazing. And I think 
governments are genuinely afraid that they do not know how to control if the genie is let out of the bottle. And that's what they try to stop. And of course, as in the case of, you know, the Tango case, uh, all it took is for one outraged uh, member of public to call up the library and, and have the book literally pulped for everyone in Singapore, where, you know, as I pointed out earlier, where democratic means are used to silence other citizens' rights. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, I think we need to acknowledge that, you know, quant, uh, quantitatively, the arts do not have much of a scope within society, but mm -hmm. qualitatively, effectively, and effectively, they carry an immense power. Um, would any of the other panelists like to also comment? Um, Anne or Siva? If you could un uh, unmute your mic, please. I think governments have always been uh, fearful of what the arts community can do. In this country, you know, it, it's been very clear from the 50s and 60s, for example, the way the special branch uh, intensively monitored uh, what you call creative activities, especially songs, uh, you know, theater performances by left-wing movements and that continued for for some time mm -hmm. and in a way that that is the uh, the legacy of control which we have now as i said earlier it comes from that mm -hmm. and and i think as uh, is right the singapore government is particularly paranoid about that uh, for in malaysia it's it, i don't know it, it's hard to put the finger on it you get these the state uh, act, state responses oppressive uh, responses um, to to creative uh, products which are seen to challenge uh, narratives and so on. And, but what is also of concern now because, and this is more in the religious area because of the resurgence of Islam over the last 30, 30, 40 years in this country, the deepening, I think, generally of conservative Islamic uh, beliefs, thinking uh, and so on, which, and you can see that. Uh, the public seems to get involved as well now public reactions to events, uh, public reactions to, to certain, you know, uh, events in the theater, in theater, in books, in films. Uh, Yasmin Ahmad's books, uh, films come to mind here, yeah? and these have invited reactions. So it's not just the state anymore now, it's also the public, uh, well, as I say, expre expre expressing their democratic rights, but at the end of the day, denying freedom of expression for, for the arts, denying a legitimate conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to add to something uh, to what Siva is saying in terms of, you know, it's specifically in the Malaysian context, at least at the current pandemic, the very last spaces to open were theatres. The very mm -hmm. last, last space. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's necessarily just true of, of Malaysia, but it's an indication of both the idea that, you know, this is a non-essential service, non-essential kind of uh, 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 qu quantity. And, and yet, um, uh, you know, it supposedly has so much potential for power of, of change and so forth. I, I, I don't think so. I mean, you know, if it's, if it's not seen as an essential service and people are not clamoring for them to open, then there is some, there's at least, at least in terms of a kind of urban based practice of what theater is or what, you know, performance is, that that has to um, face some hard questions, I think, in terms of what, you know, a, a, a large part of the population is looking for and considers and deems the arts to be. I think there is a widespread, um, you know, potentially a need to explain what the arts are for. What, what, what is it about the arts that are uh, uh, um, uh, critical to, to human existence? I mean, we, we kind of assume them to a sense, but uh, I think there is a, there is, because, you know, you, we go more to malls than we go to theatres or whatever, you know, the practice of a large section of the population is not necessarily have that much arts aware uh, uh, um, within everyday kind of practice. I think the other thing is also though that the division between 
arts and public, as if, as if there is this big difference. Uh, I think, um, uh, for example, um, Rebecca Higgy, she talks about um, citizen journalism and citizen satire, that actually a lot of satire that's produced online is anonymous, um, but uh, uh, this is at least a space in which you know, s some of uh, uh, concerns can be expressed. Likewise, uh, I think um, um, Dennis McQuail's use of producers, you know, this combination of producers and consumers, uh, 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 public actually being involved in, in more uh, creation of, of, of online work than, you know, maybe typically seen sort of on ground. Um, the other thing I want to add also is, is just about, this. I suppose it's kind of, you know, still sticking to the theme, but there are those other kind of acts of, of law in relation to you know, the LGBT that was mentioned just now about being a proxy for other fights is that, you know, something like, like the sort of carnal uh, 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 intercourse against the order of nature, you know, which is in the, in the, the penal code and something of liwat, which is against sexual relations uh, between men. I mean, these are also laws in which the kind of, um, the unspeakable acts become more speakable than less. You know, the more these these the, the, these are d discussed, the, the, the names of these, that these are uh, still very very much present. And I think for um, LGBT communities within that are pr using work right now in the pandemic, uh, um, there is a feeling to still want to get involved, to still want to press on, even though there are very serious conditions around, you know, a lot of artists actually changing occupations to become grab drivers, to cook and clean and all of these. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, the fight continues. It's not as if uh, uh, it has uh, died entirely, you know. I think, I think um, being able to, to, to continue with the creation of, of work is, is important. Um, Non-essential must be made essential. Uh, 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 made essential. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So I actually just want to ask, I want to end actually just asking all of you, because a lot of times when we talk about censorship of the arts, it's, it's, it's very much as a binary conversation, right? The artist is performing to the gaze of the state. The state is, is watching the artist and responding. And, and, and even when these, these incidents make it into this public sphere that we're talking about, what happens is that it is almost like the public is viewing this kind of you know, binary conversation, the recalcitrant artists or the, or the human rights artists versus the state, right? The benevolent state or the state that is repressive. But I don't think, we, you know, we talk a little enough about what the impact of this is on, on the public, right? And the way that the public then seeds to some of the issues that you're talking about, that there's a particular view of the arts, which is narrow, which is that only, it only breaks out into public space when there's moments of trouble, uh, when it's causing trouble rather than the value of what the arts can be. And, and so maybe I just ask each of you to maybe talk about just very briefly, what is loss? What does, the, what does society lose when artists are not allowed the space to make work and to express themselves? So not what the artists lose, but what does society lose? Hmm. Who's going to start? <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the silence is very troubling. You. <laughs> You're starting. <laughs> uh, I, if I may, then, uh, let me, let, let me, let, uh, Siva, you, do, you want to, do you want to say something first? Well, mine is going to be very brief. Um, the arts community creates conversations, important conversations through various forms of, through various art forms. I mean, you know, film, dance, uh, plays and so on. So if, I mean, again, and there are also a range of artists doing this. Not, not everyone, not every artist is a human rights type artist. Many artists are mainstream. They just want to put the art on display. They don't get into a confrontation with the state, but some artists are there trying to perhaps even create a con confrontation with the state as part of the art process of creation of art. Fami Reza is a, is a great example of that. He knows exactly what he's doing. He wants to create a conversation beyond the art piece. And so 
what we lose, I mean, what we lose is perhaps, um, uh, because that was the question you posed, what does, what, what does society lose? What does society lose? lose? We, we lose those conversations. I mean, uh, those, those conversations which are on the edge, you know, the, the cutting edge conversations. And we'll, we'll have more of the mainstream conversations that are pretty much part of what the state wants it to be. A non, uh, nothing controversial, so you, entertainment, uh, you know, nothing that's going to disturb uh, the state, basically. But society needs much more than that. And that's what Thank we're going to lose out. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I'll, if I yes. may, I'll just take it forward from there. I mean, you've talked about conversations. Uh, when we speak, I think the greatest impetus for us to speak is that we know that there are listeners. And I think when the artist makes works, he makes works for, or her, her works are for the people. And this is fundamental to the practice of art, to the making of art. And as we know, I mean, when the pandemic broke, the greatest consolation we got was from our books, from our music, from our plays, uh, you know, and, and the, the consolation and the comfort, I think, that art can give has nothing to do with the fact that it is critical and that it, is, it resists uh, some kind of politics, but it, that it speaks to people and that it offers consolation. And it offers consolation ultimately because it helps societies to form a conscience mm. in order that we can form the conscience through which we can judge ourselves and our peers and you know, our society. We need to have this, this process. And um, I think it's absolutely vital, absolutely vital. Thank you. Anne and Katrina, if you have nothing to add, then I will round up. This is your last chance because we do have to hand over. <laughs> well, but uh, I think that... Andrew, yeah, sure. Katrina, go, 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 you please go. <laughs> I think... Um, one minute, one minute. <laughs> one minute. For the Philippines, I think really what we're losing is just a sense of the things that we hold fundamental to our existence in this country, which is democracy and freedom. Um, the moment we just decided to watch um, the government do what it has done the past four years. We slowly but surely lost our sense. We lost our voice. We lost our sense of what is right and wrong. And I think when we got lost in the quagmire of um, disinformation, um, just everyone speaking at the same time, saying too many things, half the time not even really contradicting each other anymore, but also not uniting on one thing and moving forward in the same direction. I think that's what we, that's what we lost. We lost lost our sense of unity and it's really why we're where we are at this point in this country. Thank you very much Arsivarasa, Tisa Sitaran, Ann Lee and Katrina Stewart Santiago and thank you very much all of you for joining us. Um, please do check out articulator.com and um, a recording of this talk will be on on our website as well as on the MOM website. I thank you very much to the Museum of Movements for inviting us and I now hand you back to the very able hands of Rami. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, everyone. This was a very important conversation. We have learned a lot about a region that is not talked much about in the media in this part of the world. Thank you so much. Thanks, Arts Equator. Thanks, How Round. And thanks, Museum of Movements, for hosting this Freedom Talk. The Freedom Talks are a series of conversations and artistic intervention connected to the annual Safe Havens Conference that is hosted this year by Museum of Movements. Museum of Movements has been building a very unique operation in the last five years. It has had a very special sensitivity in sharing authorities with the many NGOs and civil rights organizations that took part from the very beginning, always with the passion for artistic freedom and free speech. Um, the Museum of Movement, I want to share with you that we are very sad and shocked that the Swedish state will cut the funding for the Museum of Movement from the next year. The feeling of ownership was shared by many, and the loss will be also very widely shared. It seems that the Museum of Movement has become a movement in itself. However, I've been assured that mom 
will be operating as planned for the rest of the year. And this means that the 2020 Safe Havens Conference is still on, spearheaded by the Museum of Movements in collaboration with Safe Muse. And a new platform for this will surely be in place for the next year. Freedom Talks will continue, and the next Freedom Talk will be in collaboration with Index on Censorship, October 30s, mapping the conditions of freedom of speech under COVID-19. Don't miss it. Thanks you all for joining us today and stay safe. Thank you.